I'd like to start off by pointing out this tie. I bought this tie from, um, the only reason I wore this tie today is I bought it from, from Ken Martin back in, at, at a Chicago Pack somewhere along the line. And I said, Ken, this is the wrong aircraft. Because I was hoping it would be a uh, Boeing 714, uh, the flying boat. But in fact, it's one of these uh, four engine transports. And what I've learned since then is that, in fact, by the time World War II started, the, um, the Boeing flying boats were almost completely obsolete. And within a year, they were pretty much replaced by aircraft like this one. And, um, um, but to a certain extent, um, that brings me to the title, the veil is lifted. This, this phrase was used by uh, Richard Singley in an APJ article in 1947 when, um, when the uh, ATC, the uh, Air Transport Command, uh, commemorated um, uh, Pan Am's efforts during the war. And they revealed uh, at least a tiny amount of what Pan Am actually did during the war. Uh, right, and that, that the, um, the fact that the veil was not really lifted is signified by the fact that um, that article by Richard Singley is not mentioned in the, um, and mentioned anywhere in the indexes for the APJ. You have to go in there and find it. Um, but uh, I would like to talk, uh, center my talk about Fisherman's Lake in Liberia. Uh, not everything that I'm going to talk about happened at Fisherman's Lake, but a lot of it did. And uh, that Fisherman's Lake was the central. Here's a, uh, a cute little diagram that I found in a draw as a drawing in a Pan Am employee manual. This manual was uh, distributed to employees who were going to work at Fisherman's Lake. They warned some of those snakes and insects and other nasty things that they were going to have to deal with while working there. Uh, uh, hmm. Here is a, a Google uh, map picture of what Fisherman's Lake looks like today. And uh, uh, in here is, right about here was where Pan Am Village was. Um, you can see a scar in the, in the landscape. That's probably where the land aircraft, land airport was. And uh, the main city was Roberts Court, and there it still is. There's a, if you look closely, there's a road along the, 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 the sea here. That probably wasn't there back then. And uh, this whole thing is located right about here and at the far end of Liberia. Um, I would like to, uh, oh yes, before we go to that, um, here are two close-ups of, um, of that that area, and here's where Pan Am's Fisherman's Village was, and here's a better view of probably where Benson Field was, the land airplane, at air, airport. And there's, there's these two piers that are sticking out into the lake. Now, I'm not sure if those piers are the remnants of the piers that they used um, back during the war, or maybe somebody built them since then, but they seem to be abandoned from the pictures, and. You know, maybe that's, those were the peers. I just don't know. And so, first off, here are some things we don't know. Um, I do, this is a, an outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about the various uh, efforts that were done during the war to uh, transport cargo, mail, and, and, uh, and passengers uh, into and out of the African area from the, from the Americas. And, um, I'm going to talk about um, these guys, uh, the, the uh, Pan Am Africa, Pan Am Commercial, uh, and uh, some uh, the Pan Am's shuttle, as well as our Route 6 that is a little on the controversial side, and uh, something we call the Africa Orient Cannonball. So those are the, the subjects, and we'll move on. In uh, 1941, uh, for many reasons, 
Pan Am was asked to start some work in Africa. We, had, we weren't at war yet. Uh, the British were at war. The British weren't doing so well in North Africa. Um, lots of things were happening that didn't look good for our side of the war. And Pan Am uh, started up two separate civilian companies that were supervised by the military. One of them was Pan Am Africa, which was designed to take the, um, take the routes that the British, had, British and Boac had, had built. And uh, uh, the Boac had built these airports and these routes uh, with the idea of bringing in a couple of air aircraft a year, a couple of aircraft a, a, a week. And we needed to bring in a couple of thousand aircraft a week. Um, so the, the, the facilities were, were brought up to, um, to handle the, the new traffic that they were about to uh, handle. And um, uh, then the second company was uh, the ferries, which was the, the company that was going to hire pilots and bring, pilot, bring aircraft in and out, uh, take, take the aircraft across the pond to, to, the, to Africa and, and to the uh, to the Britain, as well as um, uh, bring the pilots back so that they could fly more planes across. So that was the job for the ferries. Um, here is a rudimentary um, backbone map of the uh, route that Pan Am Africa uh, did, uh, constructed for itself. Um, by no means do you think, do I want you to real, go away thinking those are the only cities that 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 service ran to. They had uh, about about 50 or 60 other locations along the route that they they visited either once or twice or a hundred times that are not on this map. Um, the, uh, the this route was uh, flown mostly by uh, two engine um, variants of the DC-3, the various cargo ships that uh, were based on that design. And uh, as well as the ferries would carry aircraft, bring aircraft down across to, to Africa. Some of the aircraft would go up to Cairo um, and other places. Some of them went as far, but some of them were ferrying as far as the USSR. And, uh, but some of the uh, cargo, some of the ferry operations brought it across this way and up the coast of Africa to England. So a lot of aircraft were brought in that way. Now, that's not to, to forget that a lot of aircraft were brought across, were brought across the North Atlantic as well. Um, one of the, the thing about, one of the interesting things about the, um, the ferry command is that um, in, the, in the North and the South, uh, women were allowed to be pilots of these uh, big aircraft, and it was the only time that a woman was allowed to, care, to fly a large aircraft like this. And, um, it was one of the uh, things that these, these women brought back from, from their service and, and loved every minute of that, their, uh, their experience. But in any case, that's, that's what the two aircraft, uh, the two companies did. Um, Pan, Pan Am Africa uh, used these, uh, these uh, DC-3 types um, by, uh, they, they had approximately 20 of them, as, as far as I can tell. Um, they, by November of 1941, they had the route all the way to Khartoum. Uh, by January, they had the route established all the way to Cairo. By June, they headed to Tehran, and um, um, that's not to forget that they also flew much further, but they were actually doing a more or less scheduled airline to these places by these dates. Um, they still had things that were actually happening further than that. Um, yes. Did the Brits, uh, I mean, these are British outposts, colonial yes. outposts, so were they flying before that? Uh, yes, the British had set up most, if not all, of these airports uh, as part of their routes through Africa. Their, uh, their, um, their horseshoe route and the, and, the, and the leg to Lagos were part of this. Okay, certainly yes. Um, the uh, Pan Am Africa was militarized in October of 1942. In other words, they said, thank you, uh, we're going to take over from now. 
they get out of get out of get out of dodge. You know, this isn't your jo your job anymore. So this route this route that I mentioned there was was militarized and was operated by the U.S. Army, the Army Air Force, really, um, or more specifically ATC, uh, which was the Air Transport Command. <clears throat> okay, here's a, a close up of West Africa from the same map that I just showed a few seconds ago. And the reason I did this is simply to show that, whoops, aha, uh -huh, now I know how people have been doing this. Oh dear. I feel better by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yes, so you press the center button here. Um, here is Fisherman's Lake, and it wasn't ready to be used until July of 1942. It was used for small, uh, a few uh, single operations, but it wasn't ready for cargo uh, operations until June. Um, but in, and, and so there was no ATC uh, route to Fisherman's Lake until June. But once, the, um, once things started up, um, there was a route between Fisherman's Lake and Accra, as well as between Monrovia and Fisherman's Lake, and also Freetown and on up to Bathurst. Um, so these, uh, I just wanted to show that that's how, you know, once you get a, a Boeing 314 and its cargo to Fisherman's Lake, what did you do with it after that? Well, this was all picked up by, um, by military uh, cargo planes. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the, a quick history, I'm not going to read all this, but it was first inspected in, in July of 41. Um, the uh, first flying boat landed in October. Uh, the first construction crew was actually intended to get to Bathurst. They were going to use Bathurst as their main base until they realized that the Senegalese, the French, uh, the Vichy French weren't friends. And in Gambia was this real narrow little strip, and on both sides were guys with machine guns. So they that that ship was diverted from Bathurst mid mid Atlantic, and and sent to um, sent to uh, Fisherman's Lake, where they began construction of the new base. Um, the new base was finished, as I pointed out later. Um, the proving flight for between Miami and Leo was in November, and then in December was the first FAM-22 flight, which is uh, which was you know quite famous, quite uh, quite first flighted and quite advertised. Um, uh, the U.S. entered the war before that plane got home. I got halfway there actually. And uh, so by the time that first plane came back, they were planning something entirely different. They were originally going to have two trips a month. That was going to be it. By the time this plane came back, they had three trips ready to go to, uh, to India. Uh, anyway, like brain dead. To uh, Calcutta. And um, uh, they, by the time, by the time January's over, they had started a, a shuttle. And I'm going to be talking about the shuttle quite a bit. Uh, the military, that military cargo shuttle ended in May of 43, and um, uh, commercial aircraft continued the shuttles later on. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to be talking much about the commercial operations. <coughs> Here's a, uh, here's a cute advertisement that was shown in Collier's and, uh, and at this, about the same time, Saturday Evening Post had a two-page spread. And you can imagine, a two-page spread is kind of hard to put into a philatelic exhibit. But when I found this uh, one-page ad, that's over in my exhibit downstairs. Um, the, this was, uh, this, you can see that this route, every, everybody was very proud of this new route to Africa. And they advertised the hell out of it, and people uh, went crazy with um, with first flight covers. And we uh, we've seen a, actually I watched the guys go through piles and piles of these these first flight covers. They're very interesting. 
Okay, so the Pan Am commercial route to Africa, I put it in quotes because it was really a military route. It was, it was thinly disguised to help the British in some way or other before we knew that we were going to be at war any minute now. But the, the, um, the first trip started in New York and went through Bermuda and stopped at San Juan. The first trip went to Bathurst and on to Leopoldville. As they returned, they realized, you know, Bathurst wasn't such a good idea, and they stopped at Fisherman's Lake, which wasn't ready for them yet. Remember, the cargo crew, had, the construction crew had just arrived, barely. And um, uh, from then on, they flew between, the, the trip went through between Natal and Fisherman's Lake. They never went back to Bathurst. Now, we also have, we have, um, a number of first flight covers that were canceled at Bathurst, even though the plane didn't get there. And uh, that's an interesting story that I think we'll be discussing uh, sometime in the future. <clears throat> anyway, here is a list of the best data that I can come up with of the dates that um, um, FAM 22 and similar flights took. There were 14, or I think that counts, 15 flights that went through uh, Leopoldville, Fisherman's Lake, and Leopoldville. Uh, some of them were special missions, also known as charters at the time, um, that went on to other places like uh, Calcutta and the island Diego Garcia. Um, and um, the, the rest of them, the numbered ones were, were officially quotes, officially, um, uh, the Leopoldville shot routes. And um, now these dates that I have are estimates. The real dates, the best dates that we have are from records that the Pan Am has for these uh, charters. <clears throat> and um, also, somewhere along the line, somebody had the foresight. Some Muckety Muck in New York, Pan Am's New York, had the foresight to keep the records of keep the monthly reports that the Fisherman's Lake manager sent to them during that summer. And that's the only reason we know exact, and remember, this was Fisherman's Lake. The only reason we know anything about many of these flights is the fact that this guy uh, noted when uh, the Cape Town Clipper came through on the way to Leopoldville um, when it came back on its way back to Miami. Um, and uh, I don't have all those, you can't fit all that number, all those numbers on a slide like this and you'd be able to read it. But uh, we'll be publishing this in, sometime in the near future. <coughs> but in any case, um, notice that as time went on, uh, they started, they, the plane, would fly from Natal to Fisherman's Lake and then do a shuttle back to Natal and come up again. Notice that the first ones were onesies or twosies or threesies. Um, eventually they got, they, the reason they did that, the airplane was worn out. It uh, had to be rebuilt after three routes. Uh, so they, they improved their, their, um, their maintenance schedule and they got it to the point where the aircraft could make five um, shuttles before it had to go back to New York. <coughs> so anyway, this isn't um, as good a chart as I'd like. Um, it has some estimates in there. Okay, now the problem is, how do you distinguish mail that was carried by uh, the uh, route to Leopoldville versus uh, anything else? I mentioned the shuttle. I'm going to talk about the shuttle more. But here's a cover that you could say, well, the FAM-22, the Cape Town Clipper went to Leopoldville uh, about this time, but also there were shuttles going on. How do I know whether the shuttle carried it or the FAM-22 carried it? Well, you don't know. It just happens that this one is perfectly dated to uh, arrive in uh, Miami at exactly the time that the Cape Town Clipper was supposed to have done. Was it really on the Cape Town Clipper? I don't know, and you, you'll never find out. 
Okay, here is a, a, the, uh, an example of a commercial um, a flying boat route across the Atlantic. They, would, uh, they had about 14 different routes that they engineered, uh, partially because the weather uh, forced them to, partially because the war forced them to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but they started, whoops, okay. Feeling better, Jim? Yeah. Okay, they started New York, go to Lisbon, come down the, the coast and go back up. Uh, part of that was because the, it was very difficult to uh, fly against the wind from Horta to, to Bermuda. Um, but sometimes they did, they, they did the clockwise route sometimes and the counterclockwise route sometimes. <clears throat> so, and that's an entirely different subject. But the problem that I, we have is how did mail get between the United States and say India, Middle East, China, and back again during that period of time. If, if we asked ourselves that question uh, two years ago, we would have said, oh, well, you know, the commercial route uh, dropped the mail off in, in Africa. <clears throat> Boak picked it up along the way, took it, took it back and forth. Um, well, if you look at the records that we found in, um, in, Pan in um, uh, Miami, <clears throat> and look at how much mail was dropped off by the Pan Am clip clippers uh, at the ports along the African coast. The average number is zero. In other words, they didn't drop off mail except on rare occasions <clears throat> uh, along that coast. Well, how did the mail, how did the mail do it? Well, the best I can come up with is that during the shuttle period between <coughs> December of 42 and May of 43, much of that mail was carried by the shuttle. And, uh, ho, ho, ho. and uh, at the early uh, few months for the, the, the shuttle, before Fisherman's Lake was ready, went between Lagos and, and Natal. And these, uh, these shuttles, again, would be five trips they would fly from Miami to Natal, and, and then, then shuttle back and forth, carrying cargo, cargo passengers, mail, um, and um, um, then the, 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 that, that shuttle was fed by, oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> I'm not gonna learn it. That shuttle was fed from Miami to Natal by two-engine cargo planes in, on, on, the, uh, on the America side, and also carried by Pan Am Africa uh, two-engine aircraft on the Africa side, along with probably BOAC and the military, that, that, that was a, uh, the military as well as probably even Sabino got involved. Um, so after, after the Fisherman's Lake uh, airport was, was completed, the, the shuttle was switched to, to the Blue Line, and that kept, uh, kept things, um, uh, kept, saved them about a thousand miles of travel uh, with dead, you know, just carrying fuel. So that increased their load from about 4,000 pounds, I'm guessing, 4,000 pounds to about 12,000 pounds per trip. Made a big difference. <clears throat> Um, so most of the, the, the mail that we see, most of it was probably carried across by the shuttle. Now, how do you tell whether the shuttle carried the mail or the next subject will be the cannonball? How did the cannonball carry the mail? Well, we don't know. Um, if it if sometimes, and, and then obscured whether it was carried by an FAM 22 Cape Town Clipper. Uh, sometimes you can nail it down if you know, if you think you know, if you're silly enough to think you know the exact time when the Cape Town Clipper flew, then you could say, well, maybe this one was carried by the Cape Town Clipper. But if it was the shuttle or the, the, the cannonball, you can't tell. And here's one that 
it was done before the cannonball started, <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure that yeah, this was probably carried by the shark. The one, one, some of the uh, uh, signifying features that you have to look for is notice that we have a uh, a Miami sensor here. So probably it, most of the mail, most if not all the mail that went to and from the east went through Miami. So you pretty much have to have a link to Miami to, to figure it went by the shuttle. Now that doesn't mean that every cover that went by the shuttle went through Miami or got, it, got fixed by some sort of a back stamp or sensor. Sometimes it seems like it went through New York. So we're not, you're, you're, I'm trying to tell you if you want absolute certainty here, you know, you're not going to get it. <coughs> One of the most int intriguing reports that I found was by a Pan Am operative named Col um, Kohler. Kohler was one of the guys who helped, apparently helped build the, um, uh, the, the, shop, the, the airport at Natal and the airport at Fisherman's Life. And his report shows uh, month to month uh, amounts of cargo that were carried across the pond by the shuttles. Now, unfortunately, this is cargo be going both ways, but we can probably assume that most of the cargo went eastbound and not westbound. Um, there is one report that shows us that like 30% of the of cargo came back and the rest of the cargo went west. Um, there's just one report like that. So, you can say probably most, but not all, was, was carried uh, uh, eastbound. Uh, the next thing is the mail that was carried. Um, notice that you know it builds up as time goes on, peaks at around January of 1943, and then drops off. Why did it drop off? Well, something else was happening, and one of the things that happened is that the shuttle was ordered ended on May 18, 1943. So that five trip shuttle with the flying boats ended that day. It never happened again, uh, at least under the auspices of the Army. Um, I will point out that the commercial aircraft, the commercial planes that were flying around the Atlantic based in New York, those did uh, start some shuttles um, as they worked through. And that's it, like I say, that's an entirely different subject. What happened was, Yes, sir. Five minutes. Whoa. What happened was, um, Pan Am was given the opportunity to take care of a group of, um, they had, had about, I'm, I'm not sure how many they had, maybe 15 or 20 of the C-54s. Um, these were much more modern aircraft. They, uh, they carried, you know, if you look at the specs, they look the same, they look very similar to the flying boats but they were much better aircraft. And they got to the point where they could go from Miami to Calcutta in three and a half days, where it would take a flying boat 12 or 15 days to get there. Um, during the war, uh, during their operation of the Cannonball by Pan Am, uh, they carried 7.1 million pounds of mail. <coughs> this is the, uh, the backbone of the route that uh, Pan Am operated in the can during the Cannonball period. And by the way, they called it the Cannonball because somebody was saying, well, we got them, we're getting them there in three and a half days. And somebody says, wow, that's a Cannonball. Well, guess what? The name stuck, and that was the name for the rest of the tour. Um, <clears throat> by, I will make a one point here. By September of 1944, all of these routes were taken over by the military. Didn't we hear this before? It was taken over by the military, and Pan Am's operation was simply between Miami and Cal, 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 Casablanca, with uh, occasional with runs down to Natal. That became mostly a matter of returning wounded uh, soldiers back home. <clears throat> okay, how do we tell between a cannonball and and something else? Well, here's two of them that went into New York. They don't have any signs of being through Miami. 
Um, though this was during a period of time in late 44 where mail was traveling through the Mediterranean again. <clears throat> These probably were taken in one way or the other to Lisbon and taken across the pond to New York. Uh, so that wasn't done by the cannonball. And you'll find you'll find earlier covers. I uh, in the in Hartford I found a uh, dealer that had uh, New York and Miami covers for 43, 44, and 45. And um, I have a collection of that. that that's going to expand my my exhibit. <clears throat> but here's a couple of them that uh, that probably were either the cannonball or the shuttle. They these guys were were done during the time when both the cannonball and the shuttle were operating. We don't know which one it was, but it was one or the other. <coughs> and then comes 1944. Two things happened in 1944. One of them was uh, Pan Am had been negotiating for a years to get a restart of, of, um, of the Ralph Leopoldville. <coughs> um, and, um, and they had um, they had lots of trouble. Most of their biggest problem was there wasn't an aircraft. And finally, the China Clipper was a worn out little guy who, um, who they, they figured they could use that. It was given up by the Navy and sent to Miami. Uh, but then Pan Am had issues with the CAB. They had issues with the Army and Navy who didn't want them to restart. And the post office started, they, they managed to piss the post office off too. <laughs> so uh, I'm running out. Of, I'm running a little bit out of time. Mm -hmm. I'm out. Okay. <laughs> uh, we we the, uh, the the new new route was uh, um, used. You finally used by the China Clipper. There were no announcements, no news reports, no first flight covers. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, it was a commercial, but a non-publicized trip. Nobody knew it was actually happening until the China Clipper crashed. Again, the only reason we know when that China, when the China Clipper flew was somebody saved the reports from Leopold from the uh, Fisherman's Lake. Uh, in spring of 1944, the military. Um, I guess I'm going to have to stop too. Uh, the military um, uh, took over the route, took the planes back, uh, took over the route, and, and continued the rest of the time. Uh, all the traffic was done, and effort was done by the army. Um, here is a the last manifest that um, uh, we found. Somebody, another person, in, in his great wisdom, saved this last manifest uh, by uh, Captain Lotuson. Uh, it was dated uh, in, uh, June of 1946. So somehow or other, it looked, if that date is correct, a, a flying boat made it to Fisherman's Lake in 1946, just before it was sold to be scrapped. And uh, uh, here are, we might be able to talk to other people about, this. here's the timelines of when these various routes ran. And um, that's the, the I don't have enough time to tell you all the details, but thank you very much. Any questions? Just a bit of curiosity. Uh, I see a drop off in 43 uh, in the summertime, and I wondered whether some of that went northern route. Um, you know, I don't know whether. This, this, it, as, as 43 went on, goes, uh, as 43 went on, the mail started being picked up by the C-54s. Yeah, I understand. And that. so um, the cargo was going by the better aircraft, the faster aircraft than than this. That's okay. where that's where the cargo so was. Thinking was. something coming on uh, uh, the delay goes for uh, Accra might well be sent over London on uh, BOAC, I guess at that time. Well, <clears> some of it might have. Yeah. Certainly, I know in the 50s, I, I sent stuff that way. Yeah, some of it happened that way, yes. Those aren't all the only routes that were going yeah. in operation in Africa at the time, by far. Okay, any other questions? 
And I just wanted to point out your, your choice of two French colonial covers going to New York did not illustrate the point you wanted to make uh, because the Army, the United the Air Transport Command, was for political reasons obliged to honor the Free French Air Service and to hand them those. So if you look at the official airline guide, all the rest of Africa went by the South Atlantic route mm -hmm. to Miami, but the Free French transports went to uh, Dakar, where they were then transferred to the to the uh, North Atlantic route with the Bam 18. So, okay, uh, and a little bit of you'll see that a little bit of mail did pick pick up at Dakar. I didn't bring those. I didn't put those up uh, because I brought them. But that's the reason. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I guess despite the efforts of people like John Wilson, most veterans, simple minded like me, will always refer to this as Farm 22. Um, but yeah. my question is, what's the nomenclature of Route 6? Because that's what you do. Uh, that was the FAM 22. That's what Pan Am called FAM 22. They called it Route 6. Okay. okay.